What's up guys, Nuance Bro checking in, and today we're gonna to be talking about the $100 trillion bill and its history. But first, if you support this channel and want to support the work being done here, then please consider becoming a supporter on Patreon, and you can gain access to exclusive full interview clips, as well as access to the exclusive Nuance Bro Discord server, where you can chat with other members and myself. So please visit www.patreon.com slash nuance bro to support the channel and especially if you think we need more nuanced voices in today's world. Also shirts are still available at the merch store, link will be in the description box down below. Now if you don't already know, the $100 trillion bill was issued in the African country of Zimbabwe at the peak of its hyperinflation crisis in 2009. Now you might ask yourself, how does hyperinflation get so bad to the point that you have to issue bills with a face value of $100 trillion? Well, we're gonna get into all that and the value of the bills, what they started at, what they ended at, levels of inflation, but first we're gonna have to go into the history of Zimbabwe to fully understand how this crisis came to be. For this, we'll go back to the 1800s when British businessman and founder of the De Beers Diamond Company, Cecil Rhodes, sent his British South African company forces to the area that is now Zimbabwe and obtained mineral rights from King Lobengula of the Ndebele tribe. Rhodes also sent groups of white settlers protected by the British South African police into the area with Maxim machine guns, which allowed them to defeat the Ndebele and the Shona in the Second Matabele War. The area remained under the control of the British South African Company until 1923 when the company relinquished the territory to the British government. The British colony of Southern Rhodesia, named after Cecil Rhodes, was then established with Salisbury as its capital. Rhodesia quickly became known as the breadbasket of Africa as they were producing more grain than almost anywhere else in Africa, especially when it came to wheat and maize. In 1965, Rhodesia declared independence from the British state under the leadership of Rhodesian Prime Minister Ian Smith and the Rhodesian cabinet. Life was good in Rhodesia for white settlers, and every year since the original settlers came in the late 1800s, the white population in Rhodesia continued to increase from 1500 to a peak white population of nearly 300,000 in 1975. However, times started to get rough in Rhodesia once independence was declared. After no longer being in English territory, guerrilla fighters and rebel groups backed by the Soviet Union and trained by other communist countries such as North Korea began launching attacks against the Rhodesian people and government forces. The main rebel group, the Patriotic Front, was led by its two leaders Joshua Nakomo and Robert Mugabe. Neighboring country Zambia provided shelter and support for the rebel guerrilla fighters, but in the beginning these groups weren't that much of a match for the Rhodesian military forces. For one thing, the rebels were almost coming exclusively from the shared border between Zambia and Rhodesia. However, this problem grew significantly in 1975 after Rhodesian ally Mozambique fell out of the hands of the Portuguese colonial rule and into the hands of communist rebels who now also backed the Patriotic Front rebel fighters. Virtually the entire international community was against Rhodesia. The West objected to their minority rule and what they considered to be an anti-democratic apartheid system and the Communist East gave material and logistical support to rebel fighters. Under growing international pressure and increasingly dire straits, Prime Minister Ian Smith signed the Internal Settlement in 1978, which established a new country and flag known as Zimbabwe Rhodesia, a biracial government structure in an attempt to relieve pressures from sanctions and in a hope to end the Rhodesian Bush War. In March of 1979, the black moderate bishop Abel Muzurewa was elected as prime minister. However, this change was not satisfactory to rebel fighters or the international community, so the Bush War continued, as did the sanctions. Only a few months later in 1979, along with the British, Prime Minister Muzurewa, former Prime Minister Ian Smith, and the Patriotic Front rebels signed the Lancaster House Agreement, which initiated a ceasefire in the Rhodesian Bush War called for free and fair elections and a new independence constitution. A few months later, in February of 1980, the elections were held, and the political party ZANU, an arm of the Patriotic Front, won the majority and elected Robert Mugabe as their president, and thus the new country of Zimbabwe was born. Mugabe was eager to redistribute land under what he called land reform. However, under the Lancaster House Agreement, Mugabe was forced to wait at least 10 years before implementing his land reform policies. The United Kingdom and United States governments offered to compensate white citizens for any land sold so as to aid reconciliation under the willing buyer-willing seller principle. 
and a fund was established to operate from 1980 to 1990. In the late 90s, the government began making large sum payments to veterans of the War for Independence. These payments were costing the government and taxpayers billions, and the country was already suffering economically. As is customary in hard economic times, a scapegoat emerges. President Mugabe began getting serious about land reform in the late 90s, especially since Western governments were no longer providing compensation under the willing buyer, willing seller principle. During this time, inflation was already fairly high. From 1998 to 2000, inflation increased at a rate of 50% a year. Starting in the year 2000, Mugabe began enacting what was called fast track land reform, starting by encouraging people to go to white owned farms and driving the farmers out. Where do you want to get your farmland from? Wherever I hear of an empty farm, I'm ready to go and take it. How much land do you want? Mrs. Choto says she's unemployed. These raids in some cases became violent and resulted in murders of white farmers and their mostly black farm workers. Over the years, the government began ratcheting up their efforts for land reform and continued seizing land taking farmland from experienced white farmers and putting the land in the hands of mostly inexperienced people led to a dramatic decrease in production in all crops. Here's a graph that demonstrates the drastic effect of land reform on maize and wheat production, for example. The dark and light blue areas on the graph use the y-axis on the left and represent the entire production of wheat and maize on the continent of Africa in tons. The green and yellow lines use the y-axis on the right and represent the wheat and maize production of Zimbabwe as a percentage of Africa's overall production of these crops. As you can see before Mugabe came to power, Rhodesia's production of maize amounted to an average of 7% share. During this time, Rhodesia's maize production outpaced its consumption by about 400,000 tons per year, making it a net exporter. When Mugabe came into power in 1980 and renamed the country Zimbabwe, the share of maize fell to an average of 5% between 1980 through 2000. However, once Mugabe began fast-track land reform in 2000, the share of maize production fell down to an average of 2% between 2001 through 2016, and Zimbabwe's consumption outpaced production by 550,000 tons a year, making it a net importer. Also, after land reform, their production of wheat is nearly non-existent, and they must rely on imports and food aid from countries such as Australia in order to prevent starvation. As the confiscation of white-owned land continued and became more aggressive, more whites left the country. After the white population peaked at nearly 300,000 in 1975, the population of whites started to fall and flee the country every year thereafter, and by 2012, there were only 28,000 whites left in the whole country. The mass exodus of whites brought with it food shortages, the outflow of capital, instability, less investment due to regulatory and political uncertainty, among many other problems. This led to the government being short on cash and resources as their tax base was already heavily taxed. And with new industries failing to emerge and little to no foreign investment, the government and its leaders had only one option to sustain unsustainable practices, and that was to increase the money supply and print more money. The newly printed money didn't increase productivity in the Zimbabwean economy, and there was no new investment, so the economy couldn't produce more goods. In effect, you had more money chasing the same goods. More money chasing the same goods meant that the purchasing power of the Zimbabwean dollar fell. You needed more dollars to buy the same stuff as before. In other words, as the newly printed money began flooding the market, prices began to rise. Prices began to increase at a rate of about 50% a year, and that was only the beginning. As prices rose, the government had to print even more money to buy just as many goods as before. And so they did. And that is how things got out of control. The faster prices rose, the more money the government printed. And the faster prices rose, a feedback loop. By 2001, prices were rising at a rate of 100% per year. By 2002, 200% per year. 2003, 600% per year. By 2006, prices were rising at over 1,000% per year, and it cost 417 Zimbabwean dollars to buy toilet paper. No, not per roll, $417 per sheet. Money was devaluing so quickly that the money you had in the morning would be worth quite a bit less by the evening. So people were trying to get rid of currency as soon as they got it. Zimbabweans became millionaires, but unfortunately, a million Zimbabwe dollars might buy you a chicken, if you were lucky. Inflation continued raising at astronomical rates never seen before in human history. 
In January 2009, Zimbabwe finally printed the $100 trillion banknote. When it was first printed, it was worth approximately $300 US dollars. But just a few months later, in April, the Zimbabwean currency was abandoned, and the country had to legalize foreign currencies such as the US dollar to use in its place. The government stopped announcing official inflation rates in July of 2008, when inflation had reached over 230 million percent. Estimates a few months later in November had inflation at nearly 80 billion percent. However, recently, just last year in November 2017, dictator and president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, who had been ruling the country since the founding of Zimbabwe in 1980 and throughout the entire crisis of land seizures and hyperinflation, was finally removed from power via a military coup and his own party expelling him as their leader. Now Zimbabwe is asking for white farmers to return to the land they once called home. So like I said in the video, when this currency was first issued, this $100 trillion note was only worth $300. But by the end, it was worth only 40 cents per $100 trillion bill. And in some cases, when the government was taking these bills back and issuing people other currencies, it would take 35 quadrillion Zimbabwe dollars to get one US dollar. All right, guys, that's the end of the video. I just want to know what you guys think. Did you enjoy this type of video? Do you want to see more of it in the future? What kind of critiques do you have? Leave it down in the comments down below. Maybe I could do a part two relating the problem in South Africa to uh, the Zimbabwe issue or whatever. So let me know what you think. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Support me on Patreon. Social media links are in the description box below, as is merch. And I'll see you next time, bro.